Well, good morning, Sharptown. Uh, glad that you were able to join us this morning. And if you're joining us online uh, with a cup of coffee, your hot chocolate, and you're still in your pajamas under your Afghan, glad that you could join us this morning. Thank you so much for being with us uh, online as well. I want to begin this morning by, first of all, saying thank you uh, to the trustees who made it somewhat possible, you know, the, that's a, that was a tough storm yesterday and uh, uh, scraping all of the ice and laying down salt this morning, thanks to all who helped make that possible so that you were able to get into the building today. Yeah, absolutely so. <clears throat> there, as you well are aware, the uh, number of people who serve behind the scenes and a number of people who uh, make that possible each and every Sunday for us to get here and have the opportunity to be in community. And I just want to pause to say thank you. Uh, again, as Chris has mentioned, uh, the arrangements for Phyllis Shimp have yet to be determined. Uh, we'll send out a prayer request. Uh, send out a notification to the Sharptown Church uh, so that you might be able to uh, uh, participate uh, and to stand with that family. A wonderful, what a wonderful witness the Shimp family has been, certainly in the Pennsville community, Bob and Phyllis, uh, over the years, not only with the, the store, but also in their own personal lives and in the lives of the Sharptown Church. Uh, let me just continue to invite you to uh, lift up that family in prayer during uh, this week, if we could. I want to take just, uh, well, one more, one more thing I just want to say. Fellas, uh, if you have any inclination, if you're on the fence, if you're not quite sure, if you don't know, you've never been on a men's retreat before, it petrifies you and scares you to death, uh, today is the day uh, of decision. And so uh, let me encourage you today that uh, by 6 o'clock this evening, if you will log on to the sharptown.org page, hit the button, follow the prompts. We'd love to invite you to come to join us uh, for the men's retreat next week. Uh, I think that we're pretty close to being filled, but we do have additional rooms that could be added as we join with the St. John's Methodist Church uh, from Turnersville and Kevin Brown, uh, who is an outstanding order, a great speaker, a terrific leader, uh, recognized as one of the 100 churches inside of the United States as being a multiplying church that has the opportunity to continue to expand, uh, we want to invite you to come and, and join us at Quarryville at the Black Rock Retreat Center uh, next, next weekend. So, uh, okay, that's enough of the commercial break. Let's pick up from where we left off last week, if we could. Uh, we have made some strong statements about the Bible, and I want to just back and go back and remind you about some of the truth that we stand on doctrinally, as well as our understanding theologically about the Bible in and of itself and about the book that is the Bible. Uh, we made the statement last week that we serve a God, we serve a God who wants to be known. That down through history, a God is not one who has been hiding. He doesn't play hide and seek with those uh, who, has, uh, who are his creation. We see that in the beginning of Genesis as he walks in the cool of the garden and all the way through scripture. We don't want to go ahead and sidestep the understanding and the idea that there are often times, maybe times inside of our own life, where God may seem distant, or God may seem not close, or the fact that maybe our prayers feel like they're bouncing off of the ceiling, but throughout history and throughout the understanding of the church, we recognize that God is a self-revealing God. He wants to be known. And we said inside of Scripture, as well as inside of our understanding about God, that that happens in a number of ways. Uh, the first is through general revelation. Through general revelation. And this is the understanding that we can know about God because of His creation. We can know about God because of seeing His fingerprint, if you will, in nature. Uh, Philosophically, he is the unmoved, uh, the, the one who is the unmoved mover. He's the one who's placed things in 
place for us inside of creation. And the book of Romans says that makes little difference if you're part of the Western church or the Western world or whether you're part of a community of faith or anywhere else in between. All around the world, people can look around through general revelation and see that we have a God that has created us and we can know something about Him. And then we made the statement that in addition to general revelation, that God has revealed himself to us through special revelation, through special revelation. This is kind of the miraculous means that God has used to disclose himself. The miraculous means that God has used to disclose himself, and so we identified not only in your life, but in the lives of other individuals, even in the historical record or the biblical record, that God shows up. And then we said that he is clearly evident in the person of Jesus Christ, of the divine revelation of the Godhead. And then we said, and we closed last week saying, that God reveals himself to us inside of the Bible, inside of the written word. Last week we closed then and encouraged you, and I would hope that maybe uh, you were able to take up this challenge and to ask the question, how is it that you perhaps would have seen God this past week in creation and in nature and maybe even in the midst of the snowfall that uh, we experienced over the weekend? can't believe it's the end of January. Sorry, that's just a side note. Uh, so, uh, so listen, uh, I taught Disciple Bible class for a number of years here at Sharptown Church, and one of the first things that we did inside of Disciple Bible is we were becoming acquainted, went around the room and asked the question about when did you purchase or when was purchased for you your first Bible, your first Bible. And so uh, this is mine. Uh, and I got this Bible when I was uh, 15, and uh, my dad bought this Bible for me. It has fake leather cover, and uh, inside of it has large print, and this is a New American Standard Bible because the preacher that I sat under at that time, he liked that translation uh, because it stayed fairly close to the original language. And so he went ahead and said, buy that Bible. Uh, and he actually was with me when I purchased this. And so this is my first Bible. Uh, it's interesting that long before I ever owned a Bible... I knew that the Bible was kind of an important book. I began to understand that as I had the chance to be in vacation Bible school. And it wasn't because uh, I had somebody say to me, Doug, uh, this is an important book. Uh, it was because during the opening exercises at vacation Bible school, uh, we would stand up, everybody at vacation Bible school, and we would turn towards the American flag and we would pledge allegiance to the American flag. In addition to that, we would also go ahead and this flag over here is called the Christian flag. Uh, there is a pledge to the Christian flag as well uh, that you may or may not know. But then when that was over, we grabbed a Bible in the pew and held it like this and we held it up. And we said these words. Let's go to the next slide. This is what I remember. You may remember this a bit differently. I pledge allegiance to the Bible. God's holy word. It's a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. It's words. And you did this because you really meant it. right? It's words. Will I hide in my heart that I may not sin against God? I was... Eight. Eight. Seven years before I ever owned one, I had this already in mind and in my memory. I pledge allegiance. It is God's holy word. It's likely this morning that one of the reasons why you may have respect for the Bible is because there were adults inside of your life who said to you, it's important it's God's Word. Everything in it is true, and you should think about this, and you should believe this. But I want you to know that, uh, you know, 
the idea of verses and chapters, the idea in the back where you have these beautiful charts and have these graphs, that is not how the Bible came to us. It is not. It's not how the Bible came to us. It's how the Bible came to you, perhaps, in a prepackaged or in a gift box, but that is not how the Bible came to us at all. As a matter of fact, I want to kind of think with you today a little bit about how the Bible actually came to us in just a quick snapshot, if I might. You may be surprised that uh, here with the white background, uh, that is a section from the Old Testament. If you look closely, you'll notice there are no numbers, there are no verses, there are no chapter headings. As a matter of fact, all the words run together and uh, there are not even any word breaks. The Old Testament, you might remember, there are 39 books in the Old Testament, 39 books that have different names, and out of those 39 books, uh, they were all written in Hebrew, in Hebrew. And so, the, uh, on the left-hand side, that is what Hebrew looks like. On the, uh, kind of like the yellowish background, that is a section from the New Testament. Again, there are no verses. There are no chapter headings. There are no footnotes. There are no comments. That is written in Greek. Again, all of the words are, are, there's no punctuation. They're all run together and there isn't even a break in between the words. And so, over the years, scholars have had the chance to go ahead and identify the specific words that are mentioned inside of the Greek or inside of Hebrew. 27 books in the New Testament, uh, and we want to go ahead and think a little bit about that this morning. Now, what's interesting is, many of us then have had the chance to go ahead, and when we got our first Bible, or when someone said uh, to us about the Bible, maybe you uh, were faithful in attendance, and you got a Bible because you came to Sunday school and, and you got one. Maybe you graduated out of one of the programs and you got a Bible. I'm not sure, but uh, your first Bible. And then maybe some of you started to read the Bible. You started to read the Bible. And not only you read the Bible, but you read things that no one ever talked about in Sunday school. <clears throat> you actually read things that no one ever talked about in church. And you began to have some questions about the Bible. And so you went to see the preacher, or you went to see the priest, or you went to see a friend or a Sunday school teacher, and you asked a question about that section of the Bible, and they couldn't answer it. And not only they couldn't answer it, they didn't even know it was in there. And so as a result of that, some of us, inside of our life, walked away from faith because there were some things that we could not reconcile about the Bible and we couldn't reconcile about our faith inside of our current world. Now, that still may be true for many of you this morning. That may be true for many of you joining us online today. I want to just remind you that the Bible does not begin... The Bible does not begin in Genesis in the beginning. That's not how we got our Bible. As a matter of fact, the Bible begins somewhere right around two-thirds of the way through. And I want to introduce to you about the Bible and how we got our Bible through the words of one of the authors inside of the Bible. Maybe not the earliest, but certainly helps us understand most specifically about how we got this book. Let me remind you, if I could, this morning. This comes from a gentleman who was a medical doctor. He was a medical doctor, and he wasn't even Jewish. He was Gentile. And as a Gentile, he had a number of different friends inside of the world. One of his very close friends, though, was a very wealthy man. Uh, he was named Theophilus. And so let me share with you, right out of Luke's document about Jesus, as we think together about how we actually got this book. 
Because when the first records were being written, they were not writing the Bible. So track with me for just a couple of minutes. Notice, if you will, Luke chapter 1 opens with these words. Many, many, this is one account of several. This is one account of many. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that were being fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself, says Dr. Luke, I myself have investigated everything. Luke was the investigative reporter of the New Testament, if you will, about the life of Jesus Christ. He has talked to eyewitnesses. He has interviewed people whose lives have been changed by Jesus Christ. He has been one who's kind of followed along and watched what happened in the life of Jesus. And he says, I too, I've joined the many other people who have decided to write about these accounts. I've decided to write about this because this is important to write an orderly account for you, Theophilus. I wrote this so that other people too might recognize the story. So you may know with certainty the things that have been taught. When Luke is writing... Luke is not intending to write the Bible. Luke's life has been radically shaped by the person of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, as he interviews eyewitnesses, and as he talks to people who had first-hand experience with Jesus, Luke begins to set that down in an orderly account. And he and Theophilus, then, as they share this document, they want other people to know and hear about how it is that Jesus has made a difference in their life as an eyewitness account. By the time you come to the end of Luke's story, he writes this about two very particular men. Let's go to the next slide if we can. He's telling about a guy whose name is Nicodemus, who everybody knew in that area of the world, Nicodemus, and also not only Nicodemus, but also Joseph of Arimathea. He's telling how Jesus was crucified. He's telling how Jesus died upon the cross and the Romans put him there. He's telling how at the end, after his death, that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea uh, took Jesus' body down and wrapped it in linen cloth and they put it inside of a tomb that had not been previously used. And then, the next day, the women came because Jesus was dead and they came to re-embalm Jesus at the tomb and where the body was. Now, if this is where the story ends, there would be no the Bible. If this is where the story ends, with individuals who are heart sick about the death of Jesus Christ, there would be no the Bible. There would not be one. But Luke, in his documentation of his interviewing as his uh, gathering information, Luke finishes the story and it is called Luke. It's part of the Bible. It is Matthew, Mark, it, Luke. It's the third kind of compilation we have about the life of Jesus. But Luke becomes so captivated by Jesus that he does not stop writing there. We also have volume two. It's the next in the series, if you will, of Luke's 
historical evidence, historical documentation. And here is where things get really amazing, and here is the reason why we have the Bible. It's found inside of the book of Acts. It's in chapter 2. You see, if Jesus stays dead, there is no the Bible. But that is not what happens. Luke writes that God raised Jesus to life. We all are eyewitnesses of it. We're all eyewitnesses of it. And so as a result, you remember the very first word in Luke's account? Many people have tried to write, and so listen, Luke uh, knew Mark. Matthew, Mark. Luke knew Mark. And uh, Mark's account of what happened uh, was influenced by a guy named Peter. You know that name. And Peter, it's likely some Historians say it's likely because Peter did not have an education that Peter dictated to Mark the account of Jesus because, listen, Jesus did not stay dead. And as a result of that, we are eyewitnesses. And not only eyewitnesses, they begin to write about it because his life changed their lives. And so Mark, the shortest of all of the accounts, is action-packed and it moves really fast. And then Matthew, who wrote to a very particular audience, a Jewish audience. And so, interestingly enough, some of the earliest copies of Matthew are not written in Greek, but they're written in Hebrew because the Jewish community wanted to know about Jesus. Because, you see, if he did not come back to life, there would be no the Bible. The Bible does not start in Genesis. The reason we have a Bible is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so as a result of that, Matthew's story becomes kind of combined all in one. Mark's story becomes combined. And people who are followers of Jesus Christ begin copying it and they begin sharing it and for the first couple of hundred years these these accounts were seen as authoritative and the reason that they're authoritative is because they were eyewitnesses they're eyewitnesses and then the church said listen Something has happened inside of our lives because of this one who is the Messiah. Maybe, just maybe, they're more than just authoritative and we can trust them. Maybe there's something more that needs to be considered. And so at the end of one of the accounts about Jesus, John writes these words. He writes, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of the disciples they are not in this book they are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah John says if all that you have are is my eyewitness account it's enough the reason why we have the Bible has everything to do with the eyewitness accounts of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so John becomes thoroughly convinced that Jesus is not only the Messiah, he is the Son of God, and that by believing on him, notice, notice, by believing on him, you might have life. Well, the only person who can give life, whether you're Hebrew or whether you're Gentile, is God. And John says, that's right. That's right. So the reason we have the Bible 
has everything to do with the eyewitness accounts of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not only the historical accounts then become sacred because these individuals witnessed with their own eyes, they then become authoritative because they saw him. They saw him. So that you might have life. Our time's running this morning. I want to introduce you to someone, if I could. Uh, Let's go to the next slide. It's a black and white photo because this is an old guy. He was born in the late 1800s. He's French. His name is Emile Caillé. Emile Caillé served on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania for a while. He served in a couple of other faculty posts. He was an academic He was a philosopher, and in addition to that, he was also on the faculty at Princeton. That's how I came to know him, not because I went to Princeton, because I know somebody who went to Princeton. And so uh, when they mentioned his name, I thought I should look him up. Emile Caillé was born in a home that his mom and dad, they were naturalists. And so they didn't believe in anything supernatural could happen inside of the world. And so Caillé writes that if there was something that could happen inside the world, it had to have a natural explanation to it. The problem he had, though, was that he was in his late teens and early 20s when the World War I rolled through France, and he couldn't explain the difficulty about people killing other people he said it was meaningless and he thought you know if there's something that has meaning it makes it easier to understand but when things happen that are meaningless in their evil it's hard to understand he couldn't explain it Emil Caillé uh, finished his education and uh, as a person who was a philosopher he fell in love and they married a woman from from Britain and they had a baby and they moved to take their first teaching post in a very small community. She uh, was uh, walking their baby downtown and so she had uh, a pram or a large baby buggy and she was pushing the baby buggy down the center of town and it was on a cobblestone road. And it drove her crazy because the baby wouldn't stay asleep. And the cobblestones kept jarring the baby awake. And so she turned off of the cobblestone road and onto a surface that was grass covered. As she worked her way through the grass, again, it wasn't very smooth. Now the baby was fussing. She scooped up their child and she walked into a building. Large archway, open door. She didn't see the name on the building but she made her way inside so she could feed their child after she was done and quieting the baby she actually came out of the building and on her way out of the building she noticed a gentleman who was sitting behind a desk he was a white haired man with a white hair white long white beard she said that she began to have a conversation with him and he asked her about things of faith Eventually, she told him about her husband, who had never owned a Bible and had never seen a Bible. And he, she said, do you have a Bible that's in French? And so uh, he said, yes, as a matter of fact, and looked the Bible up on the shelf and pulled it down and gave it to her. She tucked the Bible inside of the baby buggy because she was afraid of what her husband would say when she went home. In in his early 20s, Emile Caillé began wrestling with the understanding that even in the midst of the philosophy books that he was reading, he said that he could not find any author or any book that really understood him. And so he began to take his favorite passages from some of his favorite authors and he began to put those quotes together in his own book because he thought surely his own book would understand who he was. Emile Caillé is sitting outside on this spring day. 
His wife is making her way home in a baby, bu- pushing a baby buggy with the Bible tucked inside underneath of the cushion, afraid of what might happen. Emil Kaye is sitting reading the book that he had published, hoping that all of his favorite quotes would somehow understand him. And his wife steps onto the scene. He's 23. She says, uh, you're not going to guess where I was. And he said, you're right, I, I'm not going to. So he, she told the story about the cobblestones and the fussy baby. She told the story about how she ducked into the building and she didn't know that it was a church. And she said, I brought something for you. And reluctantly, she dug down underneath the covers and pulled out a French Bible. Emile Caillé took the Bible reluctantly. She went in the house and he opened up the Bible. It's the first one he'd ever seen in all of his life. I'll let him tell the story. Next slide. I literally grabbed the book and I rushed into my study with it. I opened it and I chanced upon the Beatitudes. I read and I read and I read. Now aloud with the indescribable warmth surging within. I could not find the words to express my awe and my wonder. And suddenly the realization dawned upon me. This book, this is the book that would understand me. You see, the church has always maintained that not only we read the Bible because we understand more about God, but we read the Bible because the Bible helps us understand more about who we are. Now, in contemporary culture, we say it this way. Not only do we read the Bible, but the Bible reads us. And Emil Kaye goes on, and he says this. I needed it so much, yet unaware, I had attempted to write my own in vain. I continued to read deeply into the night, mostly from the Gospels. Because you see, if the Gospels weren't true, we never would have this book. And lo and behold, as I looked through them, the one of whom they spoke, God reveals himself to Emil Kaye the one with whom they spoke and acted in them, became alive in me. The resurrected Christ, we sing here at Sharptown, is resurrecting me. We read this book not because the words are archaic and are dead and they were written for a time just such as this. No, no. The understanding is that the Bible is alive and it's real. And the one who was resurrected by God, the central figure of all 66 books, he can come alive in us. What if This is the way that God communicates to us. What if this is how he reveals himself to us? What if we not only understand more about God, but he helps us understand ourselves? I'd like to invite you this week. Pick it up. There are some really, really hard parts of this. If you've never read and you don't know where to read, let me suggest to you that if the Gospels are the reason why we have it, 
the Matthew, Mark, the Luke, the John, those four books that tell the story of Jesus, maybe one of those is a really good place for us to start. Most people would go ahead and say, if they're going to give you a Bible and you've never read the Bible, they would say, John is a really good place to start. Because you see, if the resurrection is true and we were eyewitnesses to it, said Luke, then everything, everything changes. Will you stand with me? I'd like to invite you, as we close our time together this morning, will you bow your heads with me? It's hard to imagine that this many years later that a phrase in vacation Bible school is something that we're talking about today. That I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. A lamp to my feet. A light to my path. Its word will I hide in my heart that I might not sin against God. Today, friends... What if it's the way he speaks to us? But yet, we don't pick it up. I just want to encourage you. I think that, like Emile Caillé, not only do we recognize that God's Word understands us, it helps us understand who we are and who God is. Lord, will you go with us from this place this morning? Will you even renew a challenge by your Holy Spirit inside of our hearts that we too might become people of one book and that as we have the opportunity to pick up Scripture and to read that we might in fact begin to see who we are and to see who you are. And we pray that as we continue over the next few weeks, we pray that not only you'll help us to wrestle through aspects of is it authoritative in our lives and how do we make decisions? But you'll help us understand where the people of faith have stood for hundreds of years upon the foundation of Scripture. May we be the same. And now unto him that's able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior, to whom honor, power, majesty, and dominion belong now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning, Sharptown. God bless you today. <clears throat>